Hi, my name is Ann Fox, and today I'm going to be discussing the issue of three parent children, and in particular, the IVF procedures used to create them. In September of 2016, there was a report in the news of the first child ever to be born with three biological parents, the biological mother and father and an egg donor. The reason given for performing the procedure was to negate the chances that the child would be born with a rare and life-threatening disease potentially inherited from the mother. A Fox News report stated that in using DNA from three individuals, researchers were able to remove some of the mother's DNA from an egg and leave out the disease-causing DNA. The healthy DNA was then slipped into a donor's egg, which was then fertilized. Thus, the child inherited DNA from his two parents and an egg donor. So the question under, under consideration are what are the moral implications of three parent children and the procedures used to create them? Now to provide you with some background, the main focus and purpose of this procedure is to avoid a child developing a mitochondrial disease such as Kern-Sayer syndrome, Pearson syndrome, and Lee syndrome that are passed on through the mother's mitochondria. There are two procedures that are pertinent to this initiative. The first is called pronuclear transfer, or PNT for short, and the second is maternal spindle transfer, or MST. I have a diagram that shows an outline of how each procedure is conducted. PNT involves the creation of two zygotic human beings in a petri dish. One zygote is formed from the sperm of the father and the egg of the mother, and the other is formed with the sperm of the father and the egg from a donor. The zygote from the mother-father is believed to be defective due to a mitochondrial abnormality. The pronuclei of both zygotes are then removed and the pronucleus from the father donor zygote is discarded. The pronucleus from the mother-father zygote is then transferred into the remaining father donor zygote. The newly formed zygote now contains genetic material from three people pronucleus from the mother-father zygote, and the mitochondria from the father-donor zygote. In the maternal spindle transfer, or MST, it differs from PNT in that rather than transferring a pronucleus from one zygotic body to another, the MST process involves the transfer of genetic material from the contracting mother's egg to the donor's egg prior to the donor's egg being fertilized. The spindle of chromosomes is removed from each egg, and the chromosomes from the mother's egg is placed into the remaining portion of the donor's egg. Afterwards, the new egg is fertilized with the father's sperm. In the first peer review article entitled, Are You My Mommies? Toward Three Parent IVF by Arlen Nichols, he discusses four main points regarding the ethical issues of such a procedure. The first is in regards to marriage and in vitro fertilization. In it, he contends that the procreation process must be first judged in light of the marital act. Newly created technologies must always regard marriage and the marital act. In other words, it must not disassociate procreation from the marital act of one man and one woman. Technologies, according to the Catholic Church, must assist or aid in the marital act in achieving its natural end, but not be a replacement or a substitute. The second point that Nichols makes is in regards to the, to the manipulation of the genome. These two procedures are a radical manipulation of the germline. Science simply does not allow, um, excuse me, science simply does not know all the short, long-term implications of a three-parent child. Manipulation of embryonic human life is likely to have harmful side effects, not only on those children conceived through this process, but potentially the children conceived by those children. This also promotes a eugenic mentality, which can lead to the unjust discrimination against the weak and the oppression of the vulnerable. The third point that Nichols makes is in regards to the disregard for life. In particular, with the PNT procedure, the human embryos of both the mother-father zygote and donor-father zygote are manipulated and the latter is ultimately destroyed. A human life is therefore sacrificed for therapeutic ends. We must recognize that the PNT procedure in particular creates an environment where the loss of human life grows exponentially 
and each time it is conducted, a human life is created and ultimately destroyed. The last point that Nichols makes is in regards to the ideological factors. He agrees that families have a legitimate right to accessible treatment for diseases and science scientists should make every effort to ensure that they provide access to ethical treatments. However, PNT and MST are not that. They fall under the ideology that science should be, should be able to proceed unfettered and unchecked. That the merits of advancement, efficiency, consensus, and indeed novelty are enough to justify their existence and acceptance. He concludes that PNT and MST fail to honor the dignity of the person and offend marriage and thus should not be pursued. In the second article, points of view from leading experts in the field are provided. The opinions for or against are given an equal share in the article, as you will see. It is entitled, Three Parent Babies, A Debate of Eugenics. The article specifies the nuclear DNA from a child comes from both parents the 37 genes in the mitochondrial DNA are inherited only from the mother. The U.S.'s preeminent researcher in the field, Shokrat Mitalopov, led the discussion in favor of these techniques, saying, we want to replace these mutated genes, which by nature have become pathogenic. Dally, excuse me, Dr. Sally Davies, England's chief medical officer, also through her support behind the procedure, saying that only 37 mitochondrial genes from the donor's egg would be eligible for replacement, leaving intelligence, physical appearance, and behaviors inherited from the mother's egg unchanged. On the opposed side, David King, a British molecular biologist, active in the Human Genetics Alert Group, fears the effects on society, stating that these procedures could lead to the future of designer babies and consumer eugenics. He went on to say that the proponents of mitochondrial replacement therapy are pushing the technique for reasons more associated with social rather than medical benefits. For example, this could lead to a lesbian couple conceiving with DNA from both female partners as well as a sperm donor. However, no social benefit should be considered above the medical well-being of the child. Klaus Reinhardt, an evolutionary biologist, Fears the possibility of a language gap in the genetic code for future generations caused by the mitochondrial and nuclear DNA not complementing each other. In this last article entitled, What is the Value of Three-Parent IVF?, the author focuses on the social value of three-parent IVF and argues that the technology does not meet the plausible social value standard for public research investment. While other commentators on the subject of three-parent IVF choose to focus on issues such as safety and risk to children, natural and traditional ways of conception, genetic and germline engineering, risk to future generations, and the possibility that acceptance of these procedures is a slippery slope to cloning, this article focuses on the social value of the procedures in order to justify using public resources. We will discuss a few of the categories identified in the article. The first is the social value requirement. There are two fundamental reasons for this requirement. The first is to ensure that resources are used responsibly, and secondly, to avoid the exploitation of the participants. Research that is redundant or has no social value is wasteful and cannot be considered ethical, whether public or privately funded. The next subject is whether or not this procedure can save lives. Proponents of three-parent IVF claim that it will save lives, which could either mean it will cure people or prevent them from dying. It does neither, since the procedure is only regarding children that do not yet exist. Three-parent IVF only involves potential lives and not current or future lives. Therefore, we cannot speak of it as a life-saving technology. And then there's the issue of opportunity costs. For those actually currently suffering from mitochondrial diseases. In other words, we would be prioritizing the well-being of potential people over people that are actually suffering from the diseases today. She concludes the article by saying that her argument does not entail an absolute ban on medical procedures that create healthy people, 
but rather it is a call for a careful assessment of the value of procreative technologies in a context. There are two main points that I would like to discuss in regards to, the re to a response to the question posed above. The first is, how did we get here? In other words, what ways of thinking led us to place led us to a place where society is discussing the merits of a very unnatural process in regards to creating new human life. One of the reasons I proposed is the idea of proportionalism. The second point I would like to make is what is one moral basis that the Catholic Church uses in defense of natural procreative acts and oppose unnatural procreative technology? The focus of my response to that question posed will be based upon natural law. In particular, St. Pope John Paul II's definition found in Chapter 2, Part 1 of Veritas' Splendor. With these two main points, I hope to arrive at a meaningful and concrete response to the question proposed above. Proportionalism espouses essentially that there is no such thing as intrinsically evil acts. If there is enough justification for carrying out a premoral evil act, such as the PST procedure, and so that a greater good would result from such action, i.e., a healthy baby born free of any mitochondrial diseases, then proportionalists would deem this as acceptable. Proportionalism does not go as far as moral relativism does, since it does give some framework for determining between right and wrong, but it does rely heavily on subjective reasoning of the participants and the re results of the actions taken. Herein lies the way in which issues like three parent children have come onto the national scene. Proportionalism makes concessions for evil in order that good may come of it, which, as Tina Rooley points out in her article, creates a slippery slope for many more unnatural and evil acts to be given serious thought and, in some cases, advocated as the greater good. So in what ways does the Church approach the moral questions that arise from this issue? Like I mentioned before, one way is through natural law. In Article 40 of Veritas' Splendor, St. Pope John Paul II quotes St. Thomas Aquinas and says that the natural law is nothing other than the light of understanding infused in us by God, whereby we understand what, we mu what must be done and what must be avoided. Pope Leo XIII is quoted stating, The natural law is written and engraved in the heart of every man, since it is none other than human reason itself which commands us to do good and um, counsels us not to sin. But this prescription of human reason could not have the force of law unless it were the voice or interpreter of some higher reason to which our freedom and our spirit must be subject. With this as our foundation, let us take a look at what is natural, what is natural to, procreative, to the procreative act of new human life. As Arlen Nichols mentioned in his article, the procreation process must first be judged in light of the marital act. Newly created technologies must, be, must not disassociate procreation from the marital act between one man and one woman. Natural law would tell us that the further we move away from the marital act of procreation in the conception of new life, the more susceptible it is to evil. Secondly, natural law tells us that life is good and death is evil. In the act of trying to create healthy life through three-parent IVF, the procedure requires that both eggs from the mother and the donor be at least mutilated, be at least mutilated, and at worst, a newly conceptualized child be destroyed. This is counterintuitive that on the one hand, what seeks to create new life must also destroy it. Lastly, natural law shows us that the creation of new human life is only possible through the partici participation of one man and one woman coming together in the marital act. Procedures that seek to destroy or manipulate this natural act in order to achieve the same outcome place the life of all participants, both now and in the future, at risk. This concludes my brief analysis of the moral implications of the three-parent-child IVF procedure. Thank you for your attention, and I hope I was able to shed some light on points that can be discussed further. God bless.